My name is Laura Rabu, and I'm part of a youth group here in Edmonton called Next Up. I'm at Public Interest Alberta Conference 2015, interviewing award-winning journalist and filmmaker Avi Lewis. Now I'm all nervous and embarrassed. <laughs> His keynote uh, speech is going to be called Our Power, Battling Austerity with a Bold Green Vision. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that, the first thing I thought was, what is austerity? Right. What does that mean to you, austerity? Well, I mean, unfortunately, austerity is sort of, the, it is the economic uh, conditions, the economic policies under which we're all living almost mm -hmm. everywhere in the world right now. Um, you know, austerity is one of the tenets, one of the pillars of neoliberalism, which is the kind of capitalism that we're living under today. And austerity is a condition in which governments use the excuse of deficits, deficits and debts to cut public services um, while they simultaneously cut corporate taxes, but like, let's leave that aside for a moment. Austerity is the process by which governments discipline people uh, through policies like cuts. Um, and it's always the, we've got to tighten our belts and there's always some latest reason why we couldn't possibly spend money on services that people need while we still manage to give fountains of money to the people who already have most of it. Um, but austerity has been brutal all over the world since 2008. So the banking mm -hmm. system almost collapsed. We bailed it out to the tune of trillions of dollars around the world. Since then, they haven't changed their practices. <laughs> They're making more money than ever. But that saddled governments, public finances around the world with huge debts. And so governments have been cutting and cutting and cutting. We have uh, sneaky austerity mm -hmm. or stealth austerity like we've had in Canada mm -hmm. where they didn't do shock therapy and go we're laying off 200,000 public workers we're cutting everything by 20 percent they've been doing it year after year five percent at a time small programs here small taking different sectors so Canada hasn't been throw the frog in the boiling water in Europe since 2008 the European uh, Central Bank and the IMF and this set of institutions they call the Troika has been cutting things uh, savagely and forcing countries to make savage cuts. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have these different flavors of austerity, mm -hmm. pretty much all the same thing. Awesome. Uh, in Alberta, we are told that austerity measures are linked to a uh, drop in oil prices. There you go. There's the latest excuse, right? Yeah. So they've been cutting public services in Alberta for decades. Yeah. Um, and there's always some excuse. Yeah. You know, what was the excuse in the boom time? Well, they always have some excuse. Uh, it's, it's, you know, the fall in oil prices is utterly predictable. Not exactly when or how much, but it's a boom and bust commodity. Com commodities go in boom and bust cycles. Right. Alberta's been through this time and time again over decades and decades. And um, the real problem in Alberta is not a spending problem. The real problem in Alberta is a revenue problem. The problem in Alberta is you have some of the lowest royalty rates in the world. So the oil companies are able to capture way more of the profits than they do in other oil rich uh, jurisdictions like Norway and other places where they take much higher royalty rates. Mm -hmm. And you have the lowest corporate taxes in Canada. Right. So this is, this is a particularly outrageous moment to be imposing austerity on Albertans because while the government has introduced very, very minor progressive changes to the income tax structure by, you had a flat tax for everybody before this latest budget, and now they've increased minorly, minorly uh, income taxes on the highest income earners, you really have a very regressive tax structure, and they refuse to increase corporate taxes. Mm -hmm. So who are the corporations that are making all the money in Alberta? Who are the corporations that could be contributing more to the life of society, to the public balance sheet? Right. Well, they're the richest corporations in the history of money. Right. As uh, Bill McKibben, the famous environmentalist, says, they've made uh, in North America, mm -hmm. North American uh, uh, top, top 10 uh, uh, energy companies, I think I'm getting the stat right, it comes from Trade Unions for Energy Democracy, mm -hmm. a little video I'm going to play in my talk tonight. Um, have made a trillion dollars in profits in the last decade. That's probably global, but so, you know, they've made a trillion dollars in profits in the last decade, the, the oil companies, and they're paying the lowest royalty rates you can find mm -hmm. here in Alberta. And it's outrageous um, that, you are, that you have a $7 billion hole in your budget. It's right. crazy. It's because of decades of hand handoffs and giveaways. And uh, it's not because of public sector wages. It's not because of overspending on social programs. Uh, it's because of an unwillingness for the government to actually take on the corporate players because they're buddies. Right. Wow. Uh, what are some of the similar uh, patterns or traits that you've found in oil-based? Uh, right. I mean, well, here's where you come to this thing they call the resource curse, you know, mm -hmm. where natural resources and economies based on extraction 
or what um, we sometimes call extractivism, which is not just taking stuff out of the ground, but the idea that everything is a commodity from which to extract value, people, resources, nature, whole countries. Mm -hmm. um, these extractivism-based economies tend to concentrate power and concentrate wealth, and, for the, and that is one of many reasons why countries which are rich in resources are very often poor in social services. Um, if you, I mean, it's the whole pattern of colonialism, mm -hmm. right? Powerful interests arrive, start taking the wealth out of the country, they leave big holes in the ground, they leave a lot of pollution, they leave a, leave a lot of poverty behind. And when you think about uh, the, the, the fact that the richest province in, in the country, which is fountains and fountains of money are being made here, and yet your province is crying poor, that you can see the resource curse uh, uh, really at work in, in Alberta. And it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, thank you. Um, one last question. Mm -hmm. uh, currently, what's your favorite solution? Uh, your favorite uh, solution for reducing carbon emissions? Right. What's the best? Thing? So, I don't think that LED light bulbs or or <laughs> or even solar panels are really the ultimate solution. The ultimate solution is building power among different social movements to force governments to actually embark on a grand transition a massive change in our economic and energy systems to get off fossil fuels and to create millions of jobs and to refund public services and to unleash a torrent of public spending and have free public transit and free university and the world we want in the name of responding to this massive existential crisis that we face in climate change. So actually, you know, the project I've been working on is called This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate. It's a wonderful book written by my wife, Naomi Klein. And this changes everything. The, the message is we got to change everything in order to deal with, uh, with climate change. And the good news is we got to change everything anyway. We already know that. That's the work of social justice. That's the work of movements. So we have to build the power to make it in the interests of, of politicians to actually get serious about implementing the policies we need to do that. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. That was great. This is a good, good interview. Thanks. Thanks.